Welcome, everyone, to the first in-person Russian Area Studies event since the fall of 2019, when our, <laughs> our last speaker um, in October 2019, October 28th, before I went on sabbatical leave in spring of 2020, and then the onslaught of the pandemic, the last speaker was Sergi Plohi, <laughs> who presented a lecture, here's my first prop, Why Ukraine? Why Ukraine? During the con congressional hearing, sorry, there's a picture of somebody we don't love very much, but, um, but there's also Zelensky, oh, Putin we don't love very much either, so. Uh, but there's Zelensky. Um, and this was during the first impeachment of President Trump with all of the Ukraine, Biden, Hunter Biden, Fiona Hill testimony, everything going on. That was Professor Plochy's third presentation at Wellesley, having previously enlightened our community about Ukraine's Maidan revolution. In 2013, this was, uh, let's see, Ukraine, is this a revolution? December 4th, 2013, um, a lecture by Sergei Plochy. And, um, and then again in 2014, these are my props, a panel um, about the Maidan revolution again in 2014. Ukraine, what next? Sergei Plochy and remember Nadia Kravitz, right? And Nita Tomarek and his moderator, here we go again. Um, uh, and uh, on the eve, actually March 10th, so of 2014, on the eve of Russia's annexation um, of Ukraine. So Professor Plochy, welcome back to Wellesley. With the catastrophic war uh, beginning its ninth month, we watch with horror as civilian casualties in particular pile up. In his September 30th ceremony announcing the quote, so-called annexations of Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporozhye, many noted President Putin's threat of, or it's a not so veiled threat of possibly using tactical nuclear weapons. He also trumpeted, few people pointed it out, quote, the United States, together with the British, turned Dresden, Hamburg, Cologne, and many other German cities into ruins without military necessity during World War II. This was done defiantly and without any, I repeat, military necessity. There was only one goal, just as in the case of the nuclear bombings in Japan, to intimidate our country and the whole world. What? Um, and, the, and then the fact that Putin then immediately proceeded to bomb Kiev and other Ukrainian cities, just as he had talked about the lack of necessity of bombing Dresden, Hamburg, and Cologne is kind of surreal. And how are we going to understand this war? What brought it about? Um, how is this war to be uh, fathomed in this same area in which the Cold War ended some 30 years ago? This is what our speaker will explore this evening. Sergei Plochy is the Mikhailo Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History and the Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. He's surely the most accomplished and prolific historian of Ukraine and the US and likely in the, is there still such a thing as the Western world? Well, in any way, in the Western world, if there is still such a thing. He's the author of what I, considered to be a jaw-dropping number of brilliant books related to Ukraine, to Russia, to Eastern Europe, to World War II, and the Cold War. And the gestation period of his books seems to be like 12 to 18 months. They come out one after another. His most recent books include Chernobyl, History of a Tragedy, 
also Nuclear Folly, A History of the Cuban Missile Crisis, his latest book, Atoms and Ashes, A Global History of Nuclear Disasters, was released by Norton in the US and Penguin in the UK in May of 22. Professor Plochy and I go back a ways. I believe he chanced uh, upon a book of mine when he was still a youngster. <laughs> um, and I have attended one after another, numerous book, new book presentations by him over the years, mostly in the Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge. Um, and I was also delighted to compose a blurb for one of his, I would say, oh, thank you, quirkier books, Forgotten Bastards of the Eastern Front, American Airmen Behind the Soviet Lines and the Collapse of the Grand Alliance, with a blurb um, on the back. So it's wonderful to have him back. And once again, Professor Serhii Plochi, welcome back to Wellesley. Thank you. I'll leave these here. Sure. Oh, and you're going to get this one to take home. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Professor Tomarkin, thank you, thank you so much for this, for this introduction, and it's it's such a pleasure to be back at Wellesley and be in person, be live. Um, uh, the I, I really didn't know that that was my fourth fourth appearance here, <laughs> and I can tell you from what I remember that probably lectures were mine, but all the wonderful titles were yours. Uh, so I, I, I think that was the, 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 that was a collective effort, and uh, uh, the the topics that I discussed before, um, maybe on some level were more cheerful, right? There was Maidan, there was revolution, there was mm, excitement, there was hope, and now we are in the middle of a very very different sort of experience. It is the war. And um, it pretty soon became clear that this is, this is the largest war, at least in Europe, since World War II, in terms of the number of the soldiers on the ground, in terms of the sort of equipment and armaments, in terms of the scope of the battles, in terms of the uh, victims, destruction of the livelihood, destruction of the cities, uh, and and uh, last but not least, in terms of war atrocities. Uh, the really, uh, I, I'm not sure about the world, but certainly Europe didn't see anything of that kind, of that sort, since, since 1945. And uh, uh, for many of us, including myself, this all-out uh, attack on Ukraine in February of this year came on some level as a surprise. And uh, um, the, 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 the surprise was not really related to the fact that maybe as a historian or so political scientist, we couldn't, we couldn't predict something like that. But it was more like a psychological thing that the, the deep down, uh, I, probably I will speak about myself, but I, I suspect that that can be, can be also somehow mm, the, 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 the situation with my colleagues. Deep down, we believe that history had come to an end. Not maybe in the way how Francis Fukuyama formulated that in terms of the ultimate victory of, of liberal idea and liberal model, that probably as well, but in a sense that, that um, the horrible wars like the Second World War, the sort of atrocities, the annexation of the territory, that that was in the past. The, the fall of the Berlin Wall really gave to all of us and to people who lived at that time there, who was born later, this not just hope, but almost, almost a, a certainty, a conviction that things like that could not be, could not be repeated. And then, in the, last, in the last 10 plus years, 
you see history coming back in the most, in the most uh, horrible way possible. Um, the annexation of the Crimea in 2014, this war didn't start in February of this year. The, the war started in February of 2014 with the Russian commanders taking over the uh, buildings of the uh, Crimean parliament and Crimean government, dragging in deputies of the Crimean parliament to, to the building and forcing them to vote. And not yet for the either Crimean independence or the Crimea journey in Russia, but on the extension of the, of the um, autonomous right, rights of the Crimea. So that, that, that was one thing. Another thing is that we all witnessed, and that's, that's outside of the region that I'm, I'm talking about, globally in the world, the repetition of the pattern of the 1930s, with the Great Depression being been uh, finding parallels in, in, the, in the Great Recession, the rise of the populism, the rising of authoritarian governments and authoritarian regimes. And this time around, unlike it was the case in the 1930s, the United States also being part of that, of that global process and global transformation with, with the rise of populism and, and some, some authoritarian tendencies. And finally, we got, we got the war that is already at this point and was even a few weeks after it started already the second largest war after, after the Second World War. And the trick is that that war is not over yet. The destruction is not over yet. And we don't know where, where the, when the war will end and, and where and how it would end with the, with the more and more um, uh, attention and, and focus is being, is being on the possibility of the use of the weapons of mass destruction, including, include, including nuclear weapons. So what, what, what history can really offer in, in maybe understanding of these of this processes? And one, one possible frame to look at this war is really the frame that I just presented, that I just described this parallels with the 1930s. Uh, but there are also, there are also other, other parallels and other ways, again, to use history to, to understand the processes that are underway. And history really, literally, is written all over this war from its start, from its motivations, to what is happening on the ground today, and history, I am sure, can also help us to, to think about one, two, three possible scenarios of how this war can end, and also assess the impact that it already had on us as an international community, as world community, and the impact that it would have on the region as well. So speaking about history written all over the, the, the motivations for this war, what comes to mind, and it's right there, it's right there on the surface, is of course Vladimir Putin and his unhealthy obsession with history, and his, his uh, misuse and abuse of history. The speech that was a de facto declaration of the war, and what, which was given um, by Putin on February 21st of this year, allegedly speech recognizing the independence of the puppet states that Russia created in Eastern Ukraine in 2014, 2015, but de facto a declaration of war speech. It was also dubbed as a history lecture. So Putin went into history, mostly in the history of the 20th century, trying to not just question, but, but completely deny the right of Ukrainians to exist as a nation, as a, as a country, as a state. And his argument was that, or at least one of the ways to undermine the legitimacy of the state was that Ukraine is an artificial formation. It was created by Vladimir Lenin. Um, really, what, what, what one could hear in that speech was really very much a continuation of the themes that were brought by Putin to the fore in July of the last year, 2021 when he published an essay called on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And I heard from my colleagues who heard that from 
uh, their colleagues in Russia that there is a general belief that Putin had written that, that essay, or at least the first draft of it, on his own. And uh, the um, consistency of the themes and approaches and, and the reference points that you see in that essay, it also, it also suggests, it confirms that, that, um, that, that claim. The essay starts with the um, um, paragraph saying that on a number of occasions, again and again, Putin, uh, he writes about himself for saying that Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people. And the essay would be a historical, providing a historical argumentation for that point. And indeed, it, to my count, there were at least 13 different occasions where Putin claimed and, and made the same claim about Russians and Ukrainians being the same people. Now, what he means when he says that Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people is not that Russians are really Ukrainians. What he means is that Ukrainians are really Russians. And by, by, by definition, they, they're, not supposed, they're not supposed to be there. And then there would be, there would be argumentation that, that comes really very much from the, uh, from the 19th century imperial historiography and imperial, uh, imperial uh, paradigms. The idea itself that Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people bring us directly back into the, into the imperial narratives of the uh, late 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Reflected in the memoirs of General Anton Dynikin that we know for sure that uh, uh, Putin read, uh, reflected, reflected in the writings of Russian emigre philosopher Ivan Fomin that we know again uh, mm, th there is plenty of evidence that certainly Putin not just left, not just read, but also uh, mm, turned it into obligatory reading, reading for the for the uh, mm, government uh, government servants or, or the, the, the civil servants in in, in Russia, um, and uh, uh, writings of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, a Nobel Prize winner who really in many ways served as a bridge between the Russian imperial ideas, views and ideology and the post-1991 post Russian history and, and post-Soviet history, transferring and adopting many of the imperial uh, uh, concepts and, and, and adopting and adjusting to the new, to the new circumstances. So, uh, Russian Empire uh, in the second half of the, of the um, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, subscribed to the idea that there was what historian Alexei Miller called the big Russian nation. The one that consisted of the great Russians or Russians of today, the little Russians or Ukrainians of today, and the white Russians or Belarusians. And this is, this is one of the posters coming from that, from, that, uh, from that era. The concept of the three-partied but still unified Russian nation was the product really of the 1860s and 1870s. That was the way to achieve two goals. First, to accommodate the rise in Ukrainian national movement, to recognize and admit that there was a, such a particular group, ethnic and ethnographic group, as, as the Ukrainians and Little Russians, but they are part of a bigger political nation called Russian nation. On the other hand, there was, there was a mm, mm, legislature put in place that was supposed to arrest the development of the Ukrainian and Belarusian uh, national projects on the level on, of, the ethnographic, of, of the ethnographic group. So by 1860s you see the prohibition of the publications in the Ukrainian language, the prohibitions for the import of the, of the Ukrainian uh, language books are published in, in Ukrainian from outside of the Russian Empire. The one that lasts for over 40 years and ends also during the first Russian Revolution of 1905. So from 1860s and um, until the beginning of the 20th century, the key, uh, extremely important 
important uh, period in the development of any European or East European nation, the empire admits the existence of the Ukrainians as an ethnographic group and actually precludes them from becoming a, a, a group or national group in its own right. And uh, despite the lifting prohibitions on the publications in Ukrainian language in 1905, that's the model that exists in the Russian Empire all the way up till 1917 and is reflected also in the writings of the intellectuals associated with the white movement or the generals of, of the white army like, like Anton Dinikin. And, and uh, Putin, Putin here just goes right into the pre-Soviet history right into the, into the intellectual tradition um, that, that predated Russian Revolution and attacks in his numerous pronouncements, articles, speeches, the Bolsheviks for one simple reason. He believes that the Bolsheviks actually were too soft on the nationalities. He claims that Lenin created Ukraine. Lenin created all these other ethnic and national groups. What we see here is, is, is going back again to the, to the imperial mode of thinking. And uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, the, 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 uh, Putin's, Putin's thinking about history is also a reflection of a broader phenomenon that is, is on a certain level common for the entire post-Soviet space. 1989, 1991, you see the collapse of the Soviet Union, you see the collapse of the communist ideology, you see the collapse of the historiographic and other concepts associated with the, with the uh, communism or, or Soviet, Soviet treatment, uh, treatment of history. Um, and uh, the, the uh, political and intellectual elites in all post-Soviet republics are uh, desperately looking for alternative. And all of them, without almost exception, they go for that alternative into their pre-Soviet pre -Soviet past, pre-Soviet tradition, really reaching out to the emigres as the, the, the people who were able to preserve those traditions and maybe further develop. And uh, the same story is, is true for, for Ukraine. The same story is true for uh, many other, uh, other uh, post-Soviet republics. And that is also the story that is presented here and reflected in, in Putin's writings. The difference between, between, let's say, Russia and Ukraine and Belarus and other republics is that the Russian pre-Soviet past is an imperial past. And whatever the reservoir of that knowledge, of that understanding of the world, of these concepts, dreams about the future, it, it, really, it really comes from the, from the imperial concepts and imperial past. Unlike the case with, the, with other groups who didn't have empire of their own. But in general, again, going into the pre-non-Soviet history uh, uh, and, and reservoir of the intellectual tradition, this is this is something uh, that, again, uh, is in common between, between, different, between different groups. Now, what Putin is, is very unhappy about the Soviet, the Soviet times and, and the Soviet experience, as I said, it's the recognition by the, by the Bolsheviks of the, of the existence of Ukrainians and Belarusians as separate groups separate nations, separate nationalities. More than that, the uh, Soviet Union is being formed by the three, this three Slavic republics with the addition of the, of the North Caucasus in 1922. That was, the, that, that was the original model. And then in 1991, it was dissolved by the leaders of the three Slavic republics. Uh, so the, the, the Bolshevik and the Soviet experiment actually it rejected the idea of the big Russian nation. And despite Holodomor, famine, terror, and so on and so forth, at least theoretically recognized the existence of them as separate nations. The irony with uh, Putin's claim that Lenin created Ukraine is that um, 
surprisingly, Lenin was not creator of Ukraine. Again, this is not surprisingly. Anyone who knows history knows that independent Ukraine is being declared already in 1918, long before the creation of the Soviet Union. But what is surprising is that Lenin is really, in many ways, the father of the Russian Federation. Because what the Soviet Union did in 1922, it created for the first time Russia or the Russian Federation, with its borders, institutions, and so on and so forth, that would be separate from the borders and institutions of the empire or the former empire. And it was that state, the Russian Federation, that, that Boris Yeltsin, who is this on the image, leads out of the Soviet Union. The fall of the Soviet Union is as much the revolt of the Russia and Russian Federation against the Union structures as it is the revolt of Ukraine, or the Baltic states for that matter. And Putin is now the president and the leader of that, of that exactly Russian Federation state that became became really uh, legally recognized as part of the 1922-1923 Union Treaty. But that's, 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 that's not what, what the, the Putin, at least in, in his historical writings, that's, that's what he, he embraces. He goes back to the, to, 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 to the Russian, uh, to the Russian uh, imperial, imperial past. Now, um, what about, what about more, recent, more recent history? The history after, after 1991. And whether we can see anything there that would, that would again help us to understand this war, its causes, and, and possibly, possibly uh, predict its, its outcome and, and um, consequences. Um, Putin's fascination with, with Russian imperial history was there for a long period of time. Once he became the president, uh, I understand that the, uh, uh, the, the f figurines or, or, or the, the, the uh, uh, busts of, the, of the Peter, Peter I, of Catherine II, and Alexander II were, appeared in the in, in his presidential office. Uh, but his, his, uh, this really um, embrace, embrace of the imperial ideas of the existence of Russian nation, this is a relatively later development after 2013 and during, uh, and especially after the start of the Russo-Ukrainian war in 2014. But before that, you had, you had different, different models of thinking that, again, would help us to understand what this war is about. So it's not just about obsession with the wrong sort of history or particular way of the, of the misunderstanding of that history. Um, the war in 2014 against Ukraine started on the um, issue that would look really insignificant today. It would be difficult to understand why why something like that could, could lead to the war. Uh, in 2013, Ukraine was getting ready to sign the association agreement with the European Union. So it wasn't membership in the European Union. It was mem not membership in the NATO. The membership on the NATO was not in the cards already since 2008, since the Russian war in Georgia. So everyone was sending the signal anywhere to anyone who wanted to listen, that signal was sent even earlier this year that NATO is not actually going to accept Ukraine, in, in, at least in foreseeable future. So it wasn't NATO, it wasn't membership in European Union, it was association agreement with European Union. Uh, Putin applies pressure on then President of Ukraine Yanukovych who takes back his promises that he was given to the entire country for one, more than one year to sign an association agreement. And a bribe of $15 billion, actually, is, is not entirely given. The, the first tranche goes with $3 billion, but $15 billion is promised. And uh, Ukraine re rebels on the, on, the issue, on the issue of the association agreement, and then the crackdown on the students on the, on the Maidan Square. 
Russia moves in uh, in February, in late February, and takes over the Crimea. Once the uh, Yanukovych leaves Kiev for, for Russia, and a new government is being installed that is widely viewed as pro-Western government. So why to start the war over the document called Association Agreement with European Union? The reason is that if Ukraine signs that agreement, and it actually did, it couldn't join any other trade union or political union or otherwise. And that was the key, the key part of Putin's thinking when he came to the presidential office for the third time. Creation of the, of the Eurasian Union as one of the poles in multipolar world, apart from Europe and China. For Russia to achieve that goal, it had to have control over the post-Soviet space. Not the old Soviet control, not the old imperial pre-1917 control, but nevertheless some form of effective political, military, and other, and other control. Uh, to, to have that form of control, Ukraine was really essential for, for Putin's thinking, or actually it was essential for thinking about the post-Soviet space or Soviet space to go, for Gorbachev and for Boris Yeltsin. The Soviet Union fell in 1991 on the issue of Ukraine. It was the only republic in the Soviet Union that held a referendum on independence. More than 92% of Ukrainians voted for independence. The question that they answered when they went to, to the referendum was not the future of the Soviet Union, that no one, no one asked them about that. The question was whether you support the decision of your parliament to declare independence of Ukraine from the Soviet Union. And 92 plus percent of those who participated in the election said yes, there would be majorities in every, in every region of Ukraine, including, including the Crimea, in support of that decision. Uh, the Soviet Union fell apart within one week after, after the Ukrainian referendum, dissolved by, by Yeltsin, Kravchuk of Ukraine, and, and Shushkevich of Belarus. And the reason for that was that Russia was not prepared or was not interested in continuation of the Soviet project without the second largest republic in the Soviet Union, economically in terms of the population, plus Slavic Republic, and plus at that time it already started to matter, traditionally Orthodox, or East Christian at least. Um, so in 2013 or 2014, to reestablish Russia as a regional power with the, at the head of the regional bloc that could compete with the European Union and with China, you needed Ukraine. Because without second largest part, the, 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 the whole structure is, is, is at least shaky. And uh, uh, what, you, what you see there is, is the, the start of the current war in 2014. Um, Putin started the project of the building of the Eurasian Union without idea of territorial annexation. But once that project started to fail in Ukraine, the idea of the territorial annexation creation of the greater Russia comes, comes to the fore. And many people before me compared the annexation of the Crimea with Anschluss of, of Austria, which brings me back where I started the parallels between the 1930s and the last, the last 10 to 15 years. Again, the model is building a greater Russia with the ethnic Russians who were left as the result of the fall of the Soviet Union outside of the Russian, of the Russian borders, now become an illegitimate, illegitimate 
target or subject for the, for the integration of integrator Russia. The project of the uh, holding Ukraine from joining the West is not exactly the project of forcing Ukraine to join European, uh, European uh, Union or Eurasian Union. That project stayed alive, but it was transformed. And the transformation came with the start of the destabilization of other parts of Ukraine, in particular Donbass region. Eastern Ukraine, with the idea that, according to the Minsk agreements that were forced on the Ukrainians as the result of <coughs> two defeats that the Ukrainian army suffered from the regular Russian forces, one in 2014, another in 2015, two agreements were signed, according to which the Eastern Ukraine was supposed to go back into Ukraine, the Euro de facto staying under the Russian control. And then that would become an instrument to influence the Ukrainian foreign policy and so on and so forth. What, what you see today and what you see with the start of the war in, the, in uh, February of this year is that uh, Putin clearly, clearly uh, decided that uh, the Minsk agreements would not would not deliver for him what, what he wanted. He openly writes about that in his essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, saying that the West created in Ukraine a system of elections where the people give promises, get elected, uh, parties change, personalities change, but actually the policy, the policy continues the same. And the policy was that Ukraine Ukraine wanted, wanted to stay free, wanted to stay independent, and wanted to move closer to the West. So the, the uh, uh, option became the all-out all war. We know quite well that, uh, on the one hand, th there, were, there were a number of surprises that came with that war. One surprise was the war itself. The second surprise was the all-out war and bombing of the cities and so on and so forth. But then there was third surprise, certainly for, for very many here in the uh, experts and pundits on, on the Russia and Eastern Europe in the United States. Washington and Moscow disagreed on many issues leading into that war. They were really on the opposite sides of the divide. But there was one thing where Washington and Moscow agreed on. No one believed that Kyiv and Ukraine would last for more than one or two weeks. That was, that was a general agreement. And the surprise came from, from the fact that actually Ukraine fought back. That the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, who was accused of being Nazi and nationalist and, and, running, and, and running the Nazi state, Refused, refused to leave the capital. That the Ukrainian armed forces and not just the, uh, as the Russians were expecting, the so-called nationalist battalions were fighting back. And that already the first two weeks of the war exposed the, 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 the um, um, Expose not just the weaknesses, but the, the, really the, the, the false nature of the, of the narrative on which the entire war and entire thinking was based. I talked a lot about Putin and his view of Russians and Ukrainians as being one and the same people, which means that Ukrainians didn't exist. Well, that was something that was not produced just for experts, not just for others, not part of the propaganda. That's something that Putin really believed and probably still believes in. And that was the basis on which the campaign of February of 2022 was based. The idea was that if Ukrainians are, are the Russians, they're being oppressed by the West, by Nazis, by this and by that, and they would welcome the Russian liberating forces with flowers. The entire military campaign was based on the 
article or essay called on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. One of the first things that happened after that article was published online on the Kremlin website was that it was sent to the troops to become, to become an obligatory reading there. And let me now look, look at history from, from, from a different perspective or, or use history and, and use history lenses here. This is, this is the monument to the Russian-Ukrainian friendship in downtown Kiev that survived until the spring of this year. It's not, it's not there anymore. So the war started under the banner of this liberation of the Russians that were obsessed by, uh, that, that were oppressed by nationalists and Nazis. What it resulted in was actually creation and strengthening the Ukrainian national identity to a degree and to the level that wasn't there before, wasn't there before, uh, certainly February of this year. If you look at this map of Ukraine and where the, the um, war has been taking place and, and the main battleground, they in the east and south of the country. That's where the, the, one, the, the most urbanized part of Ukraine is. That's where the Russian language is the dominant language on the streets of the, of the uh, major cities like Kharkiv or Mariupol. That's where the majority, not just of the Russian speakers in Ukraine live, but that's where the majority of the uh, ethnic Russians live. The city of Mariupol that was destroyed completely before the war, more than 40% of the population of the city were ethnic Russians. You hear today from the, from the mayor of Kharkiv, uh, it seems to me his name, last name is Truhanov, saying that after this bombing again and again of Kharkiv, the hatred of Russia is actually higher in eastern Ukraine than it ever was in the so-called bastion of nationalism in western Ukraine. The war was able actually to unite the, the Ukrainian nation to a degree that it wasn't united before. And this, this process of the, of the um, uh, um, really formation of the new Ukrainian identity got accelerated in February, but it didn't start in February. A major, a major push in that direction came already with the war of 2014-2015, or the, the so-called first Russo-Ukrainian war. The, the, People, people uh, who were very critical about their own state, about their own government, suddenly embraced the government and the institution and the concept of the independent Ukraine to a degree that it wasn't the case before. They embraced their local government and, and government over there. They started to value the possibility and the ability to elect their representatives and their officials knowing quite well that in the parts of Ukraine that were under Russian control from the Crimea to, the, to eastern Ukraine, that was not anymore a possibility. That that would be taken away from them for sure, and in case of Donbass also, whatever economic stability existed in the country would be taken away from them as well. So some of you maybe remember the footage coming during the first weeks and uh, not months but the first weeks of the war in southern Ukraine, in Kherson, in, in, in other regions like cities Berdyansk, Militopol, again Russian-speaking cities with the significant percentage of the ethnic Russians where people were marching with the Ukrainian banners against, against the Russian tanks. Putin's miscalculation was not only the fact that he read bad historians and became a bad, bad, bad historian himself. He completely missed the transformation of the Ukrainian society between the year 2014 and 2022. His invasion was based on the misunderstood sort uh, kind of history, bad imperial history, but also on the idea that he was invading in 2022 the Ukraine of 2014. Which brings me to the, to the question of the importance of the wars in the formation and transformation of the former imperial and post-imperial spaces. The 
empires exist and the nations come into, into, into existence to a great degree as the work of intellectuals, as the product of imagination of writers and painters and so on and so forth. But these ideas transform the society really in the process of major social changes and transformations. And the war is one, is one of those. So what at least I see in that war beyond the, the all atrocities, beyond all suffering, beyond all the, all the sacrifice, in, in particular on the part of, of average Ukrainians, I see also one of the, of the battles of the story of the process that is called the disintegration of the Russian Empire. We all believed, again, I talked about that with regard to the idea of the end of history, but in 1991, we all believed that somehow, miraculously, the Cold War, not only that the Cold War ended without the nuclear Armageddon, but also that a major post-imperial sp space and state called the Soviet Union fell apart without a major conflict. Yes, there was Chechnya, the first war, the second war, but actually we, we preferred not to, not to see that, not to notice that. Well, the, the Russian Empire fell apart in 1917-1918. It was brought back by the, by the efforts of the Bolsheviks that combined the coercion and the military force with accommodation of the linguistic and cultural rights of the nations. And then the Soviet Union fell apart, we see the return of the old Russian imperial thinking, which actually accelerates and not slows down or not reverses the process of the imperial disintegration and the formation of, the, of separate ethnic identities. I focused in my, in my presentation on Ukraine alone, but also think about what this war does to Russia and what is happening in Russia in terms of their thinking about whether Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people and where Russia starts and where Russia ends. Because this war is also the, 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 major, the major boost for the formation of a Russian uh, identity. What that identity will be, we don't, we don't know yet. As we don't know uh, uh, when, when this war will come to an end. What we historians, if not know for sure, then we can certainly predict, we know where the stories of the disintegration of empires end. They end with the collapse of the empires. It's not an event, it's a process. With the Ottoman Empire, the process of the disintegration of the empire lasted for centuries. And if you look at what is happening today in the Middle East, you can also make a suggestion that maybe it's not over yet. The Balkan Wars at the end of the 20th century was that or was not the, the attempt to reshape and rethink and reimagine the former, former imperial space of the Ottoman Empire, the ISIS, whether this is not an attempt to come up with the idea of that would be alternative to the nation state. So we know where, where it leads. We don't know when it will come to an end. We don't know what what, uh, what, what amount of, of blood and wealth would be still still spent in, in, that, in, in that story of uh, imperial collapse and imperial disintegration. But the one thing that, uh, at least I am convinced for sure, that the sooner Russia is defeated in Ukraine today, the better it is for Ukraine, the better it is for Russia, the better it is to the rest of the world. So thank you very much for your attention. I, I hope I, I ended on a sort of optimistic note. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, well. That's the, yes. that's the best I could kind do under the circumstances. Slavic optimism, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, if, I think, Svetlana, if you could think of the questions. Uh, so I see uh, Professor Kurovia back there has a question. Um, can I hear? Okay. Um, thank you, Sadie. I'm very interested in why 
uh, Putin got it wrong. He had this powerful intelligence uh, organs, foreign intelligence, domestic intelligence. Did the intelligence organs get wrong, or did, was, was Putin misinformed by his intelligence organs? I'm curious. It may be difficult to answer, but... Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Premier, for this question. <coughs> Um, I, 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 I don't know the, the answer, but, but I, can, I can guess what I hope is an, I, I can make an informed guess what I hope is an informed guess. Well, what, what you see really in, in Russia in terms of transformation of the last 30 years is really the, the rise of authoritarian regime is very kind of personalized kind and sort, sort of a form of dictatorship to a degree. Uh, many of you probably saw the, the uh, televised meeting of the Russian Security Council when allegedly the decision was made. And on, on me it made, it, 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 it was very revealing in a sense of wh where the power really lies in Russia and doesn't lie with the, any collective bodies of the sort of Politburo of the Soviet Union or even what used to be till, till recently in China in Politburo. It lies just with one man, with one person, who uh, is already in power for more than 20 years. And uh, uh, the intelligence services generally, even in democratic countries, and US is not an exception, have a tendency of bringing to the people at the top the sort of information they want to hear and they want to get. And take, take the, 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 the case of the um, uh, Iraq uh, weapons of mass destruction and multiply by 10, and you will get, you will get the, the uh, um, idea about the relationship between Putin and, and his intelligence services. Um, it's, it's probably maybe by accident or maybe not by accident that that televised report on the meeting of the council, there was just one case where Putin was openly um, unpleased with somebody and, and, and expressed that, uh, that, that, that criticism. And that was shown then on TV for a purpose. And that person was the um, chief of the foreign intelligence. Right? So before the start of the war, the P Putin publicly, publicly made known his displeasure with the, with the intelligence people. Um, <clears throat> my, my personal also, also thinking, and we, we, we discussed that, I, I'll open a secret, there was a dinner before, before, uh, before this lecture, and we discussed that with the guest that uh, uh, um, a COVID and isolation related to the COVID probably played also an important role in Putin finding time to hit the history books, to write, to write an, an essay, and to think about his own legacy. Because if th there is a very interesting anecdote uh, retold ret by um, uh, Russian journalist uh, Venediktov, who was the um, um, editor-in-chief of liberal radio Moscow station. Uh, Venediktov is, is a historian by training and was teaching in the high school before going into journalism. And he uh, retold a story when Putin, after uh, his two terms in the office as the president and being the prime minister at that time, called Venediktov in his office and said, okay, you, you're you, 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 are, you are a history teacher. What out of my two terms in office would make it into the secondary school or high school textbook? And Venedictor said, oh, probably not much. Well, there was, there was that uh, um, the, the Russian Orthodox Church abroad joined the Moscow Patriarchate, so probably that would make into the history textbooks. And apparently Putin was really disappointed and said, and that's all? And then uh, he apparently bumped into Venediktov after the Crimea annexation in 2014. 
And he asked Benedict, and what about now? Uh, and uh, um, there is the, 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 there is a clear a clear tendency that uh, there that Putin Putin started this war as part of an effort to get not one line about the Russian Orthodox Church and not two lines about the Crimea, but maybe three lines in the in the history textbooks. That's that's just as, as, as one possibility. But again, the, the, the intelligence services, especially in non-democratic settings, are providing providing the leaders with whatever they want to hear. And uh, we, 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 we all discuss again and again the story of the start of, of the German attack on the Soviet Union and Stalin's intelligence and what intelligence he had and what con conclusions he was drawing from it. I think that's, that's maybe also a relevant, relevant precedent. Sergey, thank you. It was good. Nice to see you again. I thought your lecture was very interesting. I'm fascinated by the whole Solzhenitsyn Putin meeting. Uh, I think there were two or three meetings. Maybe you know more about this. And I was wondering, do you know some of the details about what was discussed, or was this completely in secret? Did they discuss Ukraine, for instance, when they met? Yep. I, I, I don't know what, what was discussed. I know that the last meeting was taking place already maybe a few weeks or months before Solzhenitsyn's death. Uh, um, what became public was that uh, Putin apparently said to Peskov or instructed him to tell, who is a spokesperson of the Russian president, to tell him to, to, the, to the public and to the media that he was really positively surprised and impressed. What a государственник! What what, what a state. state. Statist. Statist. Yeah. What a statist Solzhenitsyn was. Mm. Uh, but um, Solzhenitsyn, again, uh, uh, I I given keeping in mind that again there was an, all this open expressed admiration for Solzhenitsyn. He was visiting him and so on and so forth. Solzhenitsyn's uh, Widow was invited for opening of the um, monument to Saint Vladimir or Saint Volodymyr in, in Moscow. Uh, that was already after Solzhenitsyn's death and after the war, the start of the war uh, uh, in Ukraine, after the annexation of the Crimea. So uh, th th there is close connection. And when I look at Solzhenitsyn's writings, uh, uh, how should we restructure Russia? And then later, um, Russia Vavvali, the Russia is in collapse or something like that by 1998. That's, that's, they for me really um, tell a lot about trajectory of Putin himself. Because uh, the idea that Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people, it was not formulated that way by Solzhenitsyn, but that was the foundation of his concept of how we should restructure Russia. If you think about nationalism as a, as a principle according to which the um, ethnographic boundaries should correspond to the political boundaries, the, how we should restructure Russia was about the state of the big Russian nation, of Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, called Russia, including North Kazakhstan. And then once it didn't realize that was 1990, right? Very influential text. Putin was there, he was reading it. Everyone was reading it, I was reading it at that time. It was, it was widely discussed. And then a uh, big disappointment, of course, with, uh, with Ukraine leaving the Soviet Union. Solzhenitsyn half Ukrainian himself, so he is upset. By 98, he writes about, uh, presents the scenario that Putin is trying to implement now is annexation of the four Ukrainian oblasts. The Kherson, the Melitopol, and the Donbass, they're all in 1998, Solzhenitsyn's writing. So, okay, we, we couldn't get our big Russian state. We at least have to go and grab parts that uh, 
Solzhenitsyn says the, the settled by ethnic Russians or the uh, predominantly Russian speaking. Uh, again, um, putting together this, this closeness and, and public closeness and also the, the degree of, of correlation between what Solzhenitsyn writes about and, and what Putin tries to implement, I, 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 I certainly think that there is, the, the, um, it's, it's more than coincidence. Thank you. So something that I was curious about was right at the beginning of the war, right before Putin declared, was his emphasis on Nazis and fascism and also the word genocide. And this is a word that's been thrown around a lot in this conflict, you know, by Putin and also by Ukrainians. So I'm really curious from a historian's point of view, what is the political and historical significance of the term genocide in this conflict? Uh. Well, uh, thanks for this question. Um, um, the genocide, <clears throat> again, it, it was thrown here and there, but, but I certainly clearly remember that very dramatic moment when uh, um, uh, Schultz, it seems to me, visits, visits Moscow in January of this year. And they're, they're doing the press conference in which they they got in, in, in a sort of a confrontation over, over NATO and the West, and uh, Putin brings up the issue of Yugoslavia. And Scholz says, okay, but, but there was a genocide. And Putin is there and saying, okay, genocide is now taking place in Eastern Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> So one thing that, that is there is that uh, it, it's, it's a clear example of the um, mm, Russian propaganda mimicking the West and whatever is j j just taking the, 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 the concepts and the words that are mm, already exist and are, are, have a certain legitimacy and things like that and then try to justify its own actions. So that's 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 that, 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 that's a clear example because of course we can't we can't talk about any sort of genocide happening in 2014. The, the, the Russians themselves are not talking about Donbas since 20, since 2015. Uh, once the war started, uh, the 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 the, uh, the the appeal was they're killing our people in Donbas for eight years, and you are silent. Well. The trick is that the Russian propaganda is silent about that all the way into, into leading into January of 2022. Um, so that's, that's, that's one, uh, one way. Again, fascism and Nazism, uh, this, is, this is the way certainly to mobilize the support on the Russian side for the war. This is also the way to discredit, to discredit the Ukrainian um, independence and resistance by linking that to nationalism and to fascism. Comes from Stalin's times, n nothing new. The most striking and bizarre situation is that in 2014 and, 20, and especially in 2022, you are attacking a democratic country with the president being of Jewish background, with the Minister of Defense being of Jewish background, with, uh, well, unlike Russia, free country. But you are throwing fascism and Nazism there. And, and that's, that's, that's something that escapes at least some rational explanation of what is it. The only rational explanation that I can come up with is that by, by January of 2022, uh, Putin and Russia already realizes that they actually lost the, 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 the battle for the minds of people in the West and that this propaganda is not only trying to, to target us. This is for domestic purpose, for domestic use. But uh, that that's means that whoever makes these decisions thinks rationally. And the way how the history is being interpreted and how the military operations are being planned, that is a big question mark, whether, whether there is rational thinking about that. 
and yeah, and genocide in terms in terms of the of, of, on the other side, looking at what at what Russian army is doing today in Ukraine. Well, there is the, 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 there are good grounds to to think about that and talk about that as a form of genocide, starting from the from the claim that okay, Ukrainians don't exist, right? You just the, the, that's 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 the starting point, and then and then the rest. Um, does anybody have any more questions? Because then I'll ask mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, with how much Trump is very much clear on how he is, um, he likes Putin. Do you think that if he was still in power today, that the outcome of the Ukraine-Russian war would be different? Uh. It's a good question, and I have been thinking about it. I, I, I don't know. The irony of the situation is that the first impeachment of Trump, he got in trouble over the issue of the supply of the armaments to Ukraine. <laughs> right? So Obama, Obama never, never agreed to support militarily Ukraine. And it happened, it happened under Trump uh, in, in, against the background where he was really, he was really almost worshipping Putin. And uh, I, I don't know exactly what was happening behind the scene and how it, it, it was working, but uh, I, I think that uh, one thing that happened during the Trump presidency was a major test for the American democracy, and American democracy passed it. Not, not with flying colors, but it passed it. And uh, the, the uh, key decisions on those matters are not made only or maybe exclusively in the White House. So from that point of view, where, where the, the Congress is, where the Senate is, where the American people are, that's, that's the most important part, much more important than who is in the White House. Not, not to dismiss that, but that's 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 the, the, the that's the rock that that's the foundation. Um, well, I, I have a lot of comments and questions. I mean, I still can't believe that Putin, in thinking of his legacy, would want to be seen as a butcher, you know, killing innocent civilians and maybe possibly being the first non-American to use nuclear weapons. I mean, it, it just doesn't figure. Um, and then in terms of, of course, we don't know what's going to happen with this war, but do you think that it really would be a good thing for Ukraine to agree to some territorial, giving up some, you know, like maybe Donetsk and Luhansk, in order to prevent future bloodshed and that that could end the war? I mean, when I've discussed it with Fiona Hill and Angela Stent, they say absolutely not because you could agree to that and then Russia will invade again anyway. So then, then it's hopeless. So any thoughts about you know, mm -hmm. sort of giving up any territory at all? Yeah. Uh, well, um, the, there was a comment by Golda Meir at some point when uh, she was asked about peace and, and she said that, well, the other side doesn't think that we should exist and we think that we, we should and there is very little space for compromise. So it's not about the borders, right? It's about Ukraine existing or not existing. And uh, uh, in that sense, uh, again, the, the, the Ukrainian cities are being bombed now from, from, her, from uh, um, the um, Caspian, right? The, the um, uh, Iranian, Iranian um, drones are coming from Belarus. So border, border is, is secondary, it's basically the, what has to be changed is basically the, the thinking of the uh, Russian elite 
and the thinking of the Russian people who support this war. It is very much Putin's war, but it's also Russian war. And uh, uh, that, that uh, realization um, can come only with, uh, with a defeat. Uh, not, not Russia losing territories or something like that, but certainly, certainly defeat in Ukraine. So from that point of view, territories don't solve anything. The Crimea was there already under the Russian control. The eastern Ukraine was under the Russian control. Did, it, did that stop? And, and, and Ukraine was not, was not launching war or trying to recapture them. Did that stop the war? That actually produced worse war. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's grim, but it's not hopeless. And the, 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 mm, 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 the only solution is that the aggressor should be defeated. As, as, as simple as that. And when I, when I was talking also about uh, my personal belief, maybe not fully articulated, that somehow we all learned the, the lessons of the 1930s, one of those questions, lessons was about appeasement. And we didn't learn anything as a society. We just keep, keep, keep doing the same. Keep doing the same. And uh, again, uh, appeasement with, with, with Georgia, appeasement with, with um, uh, Crimea, especially, especially on the part of uh, Germany, the, the, leading, the leading European country. When you store, start Nord Stream 1 after Georgia, when you start Nord Stream 2 after the Crimea, that's, that's basically us not paying attention in the classroom of history. Right. Well, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, uh, are, can we end on a, I guess we can end on a hopeful note, but it's <laughs> awfully nice to have Sergei Plogi back. <laughs> and let's hope that this war will somehow end. First end as soon as possible and then the end the right way. Yes. And yes, hope, that's what we have. Yes. Well, hope and pray. Yes. And thank you again, Professor Plocky, for coming back to Wellesley a fourth time. <laughs> See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.